Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Marketing Insights. And today, I'm just gonna quickly go over what's going on with Ripple. Um, I don't do technical analysis, for those of you who are wondering, this is not a TA video. Um, I focus obviously on the marketing aspects in these videos. Um, I leave TA to other folks on YouTube and elsewhere who are, you know, that's what they drive, that's what they drive on, that's what they uh, run their business on. So from a marketing perspective, there's a lot to learn about Ripple, not XRP, right? It's not the same thing. Um, what is it that makes Ripple seem to be succeeding and growing um, very quickly compared to many other cryptocurrencies? Uh, and why is it that despite all the hubbub, they seem to be growing uh, even uh, despite all the naysayers, right? Well, first things first, a little bit of background about Ripple. Uh, Ripple is uh, not XRP. XRP is a cryptocurrency token. Ripple is a brand that uses XRP, right? Built it, uh, built the brand of Ripple, uh, with the XRP token, it, Ripple doesn't actually use the XRP token in any of its transactions currently. It may when the X Ripple comes out in the next maybe months, who knows? Um, there's some updates gonna happen with their technology that might make it that they are going to use XRP, but for now they don't. Right? For now, all they really do is they enable transactions between you know, fiat and crypto at a bank level, um, and they are establishing relationships with banks and financial institutions and government authorities around the world. And they're focused on essentially being the bridge between crypto and traditional banking industries and financial industries. Why is that particularly unique or different from most other cryptos? Well, the fact is crypto was invented, right, almost as a... Uh, a rebellion, a peaceful rebellion, but a rebellion against the actions of banks and financial institutions that had, in the opinions of the developers, done not good things or mismanaged their trust with the people whose money they were managing. And when the crash happened in 2008, um, a lot of people in the crypto world decided, uh, you know, to essentially try new ideas for developing. Uh, cryptography into cryptocurrency applications and uh, you know cryptocurrency or digital money really had been discussed uh, for many years before Bitcoin came out for many years before you know the, the concept was even developed on software um, and as you know if you collect you know air miles that's technically digital currency of some kind because you can exchange air miles for other things well that's a form of currency, whether it's something you have a lot of or a little of is, is irrelevant. The fact is you can trade air miles and air miles are digital. It's entirely stored on computer databases and they've been on you know, network databases for many years, which really means air miles and things of that nature have were really the pioneers in creating digital currencies. And they absolutely work hand in hand with traditional financial institutions like uh, banks that worked with the airlines, right? And that's um, sort of so to give rise to the notion that cryptocurrency is all about rebelling against institutions is wrong because the very first one was actually born out of you know, traditional industries, airlines and banking. Um, so we move into 2008 and beyond when Bitcoin starts taking off and you see all this rise of currencies that are taking off, essentially trying to avoid banking and regulation and traditional financial industries trying to show that they're different, that they could make uh, currencies for people who would not be uh, you know, regulated by banks or held up by government oversight or anything like that. People just wanted to be able to send peer-to-peer -peer money. And the easiest way to do that was cryptocurrency. And then a few years later comes along Ripple. Um, Ripple was started and to this day remains a pro or friendly or bank friendly um, cryptocurrency uh, brand that is building 
the popularity of the token it uses um, or building the market capital and the investment amount into the XRP token uh, that it uses on uh, its technology layer, but not in its transaction layer, right? Why is it doing that? Well, Ripple has for a long time, and really since the beginning, understood that, um, you know, yes, it's not going to take the philosophy of being anti-bank, and there's a lot of opportunity that still remains in having good relationships with banks and centralized governments and authorities, um, and that there's a huge benefit to the people that invest in Ripple if those relationships are put into place and financial transactions that use Ripple become a more con a very common occurrence, right? Let's say their goal is only to replace SWIFT, right? The only, that's a massive deal to do, but SWIFT is this financial network that lets people send international transfers or bank transfers from one place to the next, um, to the next account. And it's, you know, it has been hacked a few times. It has been attacked uh, successfully by hackers. Um, and that is very worrying to anybody that sends money across international borders using their technology. Like, how do you know if I send you know, 100 bucks or 1,000 bucks or a million bucks, how do you know it's going to get there if the system has been you know, proven to be hackable in the past? It may very well be in the future, right? Um, and it's not a decentralized system, right? SWIFT is controlled by the SWIFT network, which is owned by the company that created the network. So, um, the problem with Ripple, or rather the attempt by Ripple to replace the SWIFT network, they'll come into the problem of having to fight that giant, which is SWIFT, which is a massive organization in terms of transactions and you know monetary value. Uh, super important because practically every bank uses them to send money transfers overseas. Um, so Ripple is engaged as much as possible, and from what I can understand anyway, is engaged as much as possible from building relationships. They were just recently in Thailand, you know, paid agreements there. And they were, you know, were, I think there are more than 40 countries already, right? And there's only, if you think about it, well, there's like a couple hundred countries in the world, I think 220, 230, depends on how you count them. Some people say 190, it really depends on how you count countries. But let's say on the, the maximum outset, there's 230 countries right now, 250, right? Go ahead, go bonkers. The reality is those that matter in the financial sphere are a much, 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 much smaller subset, right? We're talking maybe 100 countries, 150 at the upper, upper limit have any significant economic interest for the biggest players in the world, the big of the G8 and even the G20. And of those 150, it's less than 100 that are significant economies. And of those 100, again, the ones that are leading the pack, let's say are the top 20 nations, right, which represent more than, you know, far more than 80% of all the economic um, driving energy in the world. And of those, it really is down to about seven countries, thus the G7, right, the US, Canada, Australia, England, uh, you know, great, Great Britain, rather, or the UK, France, Germany. Um, those, uh, did I say Canada? Anyway, um, the G7, right? And arguably Russia, but really on a military level, not an economic level. The G7 are the driving factors of finance in the world. And so if Ripple is able to manage relationships and you know, strong, good relationships with the authorities, in just the G7, right? Well, they've already got market dominance in one respect, right? Because you don't have to be all over the map to have the majority of the market share. You just have to be in where the power and the money is concentrated. And Ripple knows that. It's not by any accident that their senior management is stacked with people from the financial industry, people who know policy and regulation inside out, people who have connections in political spheres all over the world. It's not a coincidence that Ripple has risen despite the negative feedback from libertarians who are, you know, purists about cryptocurrency and anti anything to do with government or centralization or any kind of authority 
over any kind of cryptocurrency. Despite all of that, Ripple has smartly built these relationships and they've done it with the support of investors who understand crypto investors, right? Not just whales and financial institutional investors, but actual individual crypto investors who are buying XRP. Um, the way they've done that is to show that, you know, you don't have to burn every bridge just to grow a business, right? You can be friendly even with your opposition in order to make a better future. Ripple knows that. They're very smart people. Uh, whether you agree with whether or not it's a cryptocurrency or not is really moot, right? Um, is it a cryptocurrency in my view? Well, my view is really moot, so I won't even share it with you, um, you know, at, at a super detailed level. But I will say at a high level, you know, yes, the, the detractors are not entirely wrong that it is not a cryptocurrency in the sense that it is not a libertarian purist anti-system cryptocurrency but it's no different of a cryptocurrency in concept than your air miles and have you ever taken advantage of those if you have well you've used cryptocurrency of one form or another or at least digital currency right um so, and those are, as we spoke about earlier, are completely tied into traditional banking and financial institutions. So there's nothing wrong inherently with doing business with traditional systems, as long as you have enough confidence in that they are not trying to, you know, do something nefarious to you, right? Or to the community you're participating in. Um, however, right, even if you say, okay, cryptocurrency uh, is a kind of digital currency that plays nice with the system the purists still come at it ad nauseum frankly and make extremely good cases why it is not a technical cryptocurrency and they're you know what they're right on that technical level again i'm not going to give you my personal opinion i'm just talking about on a very technical programmatic level uh, the xrp token upon which ripple is building its brand name even though they are separate and they don't want to be confused with each other um, that token behaves a little differently than, say, Bitcoin, right? Um, it is not a purist crypto token. And that being said, right, it is still listed as a cryptocurrency because it is technically a form of cryptocurrency and they are brilliant at marketing, right? It is not an accident that we saw a significant rise in their value after news, because that's what happens a lot, after good news that said that they have more and more relationships with more and more countries and banking authorities around the world. And there's not that many countries left for them, significant countries, to do business with, right? Singapore and Thailand and France and, you know, whatever, you know, or the U.S. You know, the, more, the more they get on the map of the big players, the more they will be entrenched in the system whether you like it or not, right? And you may very well be transacting in Ripple transactions, sending transfers to people, whether you realize you're using them or not at some point, right? It may be very much like Swift. Like, do you, you know, a lot of people send transfers to just order their bank to send the money. They don't even know necessarily that there's Swift stuff involved, if their secretary is actually the person giving them the details or who knows what. Um, a lot of reasons people wouldn't even know what network is running underneath the banking layer, right? But you know, sure, most people who send money on a regular basis know Swift is the thing you use. And soon, if Ripple is able to take even a small percentage, say 5 or 10% of the Swift network's transaction volume, um, that would make Ripple one of the most significant financial or organizations in the world, right? And you can argue again about whether or not you think it's a good thing that they're centralized or that they favor banking authority or you can argue that you know they shouldn't be essentially dragging the crypto market back into the old-time banking systems but i would say uh, that if you were going to market something successfully right first of all as we spoke about yesterday and I steal this video with the concept of artist theft right Ripple knows very well that artist theft. Ripple knows brilliantly how to exploit that. And they took their brand name and they decided to make it something familiar enough and friendly enough to bankers that bankers and people in the current status quo of power with finance and money would not be against it, 
would not try to overregulate it and essentially crush it as they are trying to do apparently with some cryptos that they don't like. Um, whereas other cryptos are demonstrating their worth even to traditional banks that see the danger inherent in those financial uh, developments happening. But rather than be stupid, a lot of banks are very smart, right? After all, they're managing money all day. They're not really all full of people without a high IQ. There's actually many brilliant people who work in financial institutions, no doubt about it. And so smart bankers see the opportunity in coins like BTC, LTC, Ethereum tokens. You know, they see all these different opportunities, right? But they are afraid of some of the things like Monero, which is more, you know, Cardano, which are more like privacy concerned coins. Um, and they don't want pure or 100% anonymity for transactions in a bank, obviously. And they want to, because they're so liable for any kind of transactions that happen, let's say if it's linked to some nefarious deeds, whatever those may be, the banks don't want to be liable for the actions of bad actors that happen to use their system. And with a cryptocurrency like Ripple, they have way more comfort zone to play with. And yes, it's not innovative to stay in your comfort zone, but banks aren't usually innovative. They're banks. They house your money, they invest your money, and they give you a return. At least that's how it used to be. Um, and um, their model right, for change is much, much slower than somebody who's willing to say, I'm sick of this thing. I want to leap to the next level and make a new paradigm shift, right? Banks are not going to be, banks are not going to produce the next iPad. Banks are not going to produce the next YouTube. Banks are, I mean, you know, they may invest in it, but they're not going to actually sit and develop it. They don't have that conceptual philosophy of, you know, being a disruptor. Banks don't want to disrupt anything. They want to stay the course, don't rock the boat, keep growing and making money steadily. That is their entire mojo. That's their whole method. That is their modus operandi. That, that's what banks do. That's what central banking authorities do. That's what central reserves do. That's what the Federal Reserve does. They don't want to rock the boat. They're there to keep the ship steady in rough waters, right? And the way that Ripple has figured out how to win the marketing game, at least so far, and not get smashed to pieces by the libertarians who are against their philosophy and their practice is to build these good relationships by bringing in people from that industry who understand the technology and the importance of the relationships and the importance of politics and regulation. And they understand that if you do those things, you can make these traditional currencies um, be engaged with cryptocurrency at a friendly uh, level of discourse instead of constantly being in conflict. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention that and uh, to say to you that uh, you know, if you're interested in um, coins that are smart about building relationships with uh, existing financial institutions, I'm not recommending you buy Ripple or any other currency, but Ripple is definitely an example of a use case to evaluate and if you have a cryptocurrency that you're marketing that is thinking about whether or not you should be completely disconnected from centralized authorities or have some level of engagement or be completely absorbed into it, as Ripple is essentially trying to do, uh, then Ripple is a great use case to evaluate, right? Um, clearly, you know, it's just it's just obvious when they're they're doing so well with their marketing. Every time they drop a solid piece of news out there um, that's you know, showing their relationship building with existing markets, they're getting positive returns on that. Um, and the reason is very simple. People understand that important um, you know, authorities of banking and politics and money regulation, people understand that those authorities need to feel confidence and trust before they will ever expect or before they will ever accept yeah before they will ever accept uh, switching right the entire standard of financial transactions from fiat currencies to cryptocurrencies that's not going to happen overnight right even if people decide oh 
we don't, you know, we don't trust fiat anymore. We're just going to run to crypto. You know, Ninety-nine percent of the population still uses fiat. But it's not just going to happen overnight that everyone's going to switch to crypto. This is a gradual, growing thing, and banks need to have that comfort and reassurance. And the longer they're able to have that reassuring relationship in place and see value demonstrated to them by this form of cryptocurrency, right? The more the benefit will be for the banks, yes, and for the financial institutions, uh, financial institutions and the banking authorities and governments, as well as for Ripple itself, the people who invest in it, and the offshoots of other projects who may come off of XRP in different ways or Ripple in different ways, or other cryptocurrency projects that'll see benefits from the fact that a company that is pushing Ripple harder and harder into the market is actually pioneering in a big way the use of cryptocurrency for the mass market around the world and not just for those of us who are in the you know, 0.0001% of people on earth who even know really how crypto is growing and what the markets are or anything like that. You know, if you've invested even a dollar in crypto at this point, you're in such a small crust of people at the top. You were like among the first people that used email. And in the first five, 10 years of people that used email, or the first few years of people that used the web, you're in that space right now. Right? Even you're hearing me talk about marketing, about cryptocurrency. Let me tell you something, 99.9999% of the planet has never under, have never heard the concept of crypto marketing. But those of us who have, those of us who are doing it, are in a very strategically advantageous place, especially if we work with companies that are smart about maintaining and growing strong relationships with existing fiat powers. Um, that's all I'm going to say today about that. I hope this has been interesting and a bit insightful for you and that you've learned something about how Ripple, not XRP, is making huge waves um, with its very smart marketing techniques. And um, if you have, by all means, please remember to share it, comment, like, watch the videos around, do stuff, engage, engage. You're on YouTube, right? Um, costs you nothing. It means a lot to me if you just like or subscribe or both. And of course, let us know what you think about all this stuff. Um, and until next time, hey, take care.